Welcome to Whispers in the Wings with director, choreographer, performer and writer Kathleen Ann Thompson, artistic director of Bellhurst Productions. Kathleen discusses on the program an approach to some of the most challenging and complex theatrical techniques which thespians are known to whisper about in the wings of the stage. Kathleen's 25 years experience with directing three schools for movement theatre and directing two theatre companies, as well as writing and performing award-winning productions for Bellhurst, has given her a lifelong love of theatre. Her enthusiasm to elevate the craft of theatre for all types of performers and theatrical endeavours is uplifting. We hope you will be stimulated and inspired by these discussions. Greetings, my thespian friends. It's been a long time since I published a podcast on this channel uh, due to my professional schedule, but I'm happy to be back with you, speaking about my passion for theater and the things which I think are important to talk about. Uh, The things which I speak to you about are all items that in some way characterize the orthodoxy of what I think is great theater. Now, art changes and reflects the fluctuating dynamics of society, on an ongoing continuum. But going back as far as Aristotle and Ars Poetica, there is a kind of basic orthodoxy that needs to stay in place if theater has any relevance to society at all. Aristotle wrote that the three noble purposes of theater were to inform, to educate, to tell the truth, to inspire to cause people to think outside and act outside of their own normal scope of being, and to ennoble mankind, to actually have a good effect on mankind, that he would be better than he actually is. Uh, This is uh, one of the reasons that classic Greek theater was so highly subsidized by the state. Uh, Quite frankly, it was simply good for the people, and they knew it. So actually, at the heart of any orthodoxy for theater is the goal to have effective influence on the viewers. The style and methodology of how theater does that, as I stated, continually changes as the world evolves and devolves into varying worldviews and thought systems. But we can agree with those changes, or we can resist them. This brings me to the subject of this podcast, which is the effect of postmodernism and material secularism on acting techniques. I think it's really important for artists to be aware of how worldviews and their propagated thought systems influence us as artists. They influence our choices, our ultimate methodology to achieve the goal of influencing uh, the audience in every way. I wrote a review recently uh, concerning the Royal Shakespeare Company's production of Romeo and Juliet at the Barbican in London, uh, which I attended this last uh, December 2018. In this review, I analyzed the postmodern effects on all aspects of this theater production. Sets, technical, uh, lights and sound, costumes, casting, acting techniques, and extrinsic interpretations. I will publish this on Bellhurst's webpage, which is www.bellhurst.com. But today, I just want to talk with you shortly on the effect of postmodern thought on acting techniques. So let me set this up a little bit with a snapshot profile of postmodernism and secular materialism. These are kind of big words which symbolize philosophical frames of modern modern man's uh, thinking, feeling, and thus his behavior. The consequences of these thought frameworks are imposed upon us through culture and consensus thinking throughout our entire culture. And therefore, they seep into our everyday fabric of life without us really being aware of it. And actually, we pay a big price in respect to the autonomy of our minds and thus uh, our choices to remain free in our thinking and reasoning if we're not aware, awake, watching, uh, the slow shift of our thinking that agrees with these prevalent thought systems out there. And as an actor myself and a director who trains and directs actors, 
I find these changes very disturbing because they greatly affect the ability of an actor to bond with their audience and thus have an influence on the audience. So if we are not out there to inform, educate, inspire, and enrich our audiences, then what are we doing on the boards? Entertainment is not exclusive of any of those things, but entertainment without having any of those purposes in mind is enormously vapid and a waste of time. Now, if we're going to have a measurable effect on the audience, uh, we must, through trust gained, which requires transparency from the actor, and powerful and skilled expressive techniques, be able to penetrate into the souls and bodies of the audience. And that uh, brings to mind uh, an illustration, which I will never forget, a moment in the National Theatre in London a few years back. It was at the end of the first act of War Horse. And I was sitting in the front row. I turned around in my seat, and because this was the National, I was staring into the uh, circle region of the theater to in the faces of about 1,500 people. And I turned around as the lights went on, and I noticed that not only myself, but about every fifth person had tears running down their faces, and handkerchiefs were waving ubiquitously across the entire theater, and noses were being blown, and people were dramatically in their body affected by this powerful uh, ending to the first act of War Horse. Everybody was quite shaken, not just emotionally uh, and mentally, but in their body, and you could see it. This is great theater, and this is the reason theater is such a powerful force of communication. It is an art form which permeates the entire human entity, body, soul, and mind. Well, how does the theater do that? Uh, without going into all the aspects of theater which contribute to that effect su successfully, let's just stick to the actor and the acting techniques which facilitate this. I don't have enough time here, even though I find it very tempting, uh, to summarize the history of acting techniques in an effort to buttress my own perspective on the dangers of postmodern offshoots like deconstructivism to invade the methodology of our acting. However, let's just establish that techniques which are used to train actors vary according to the school of style and the dramatic practitioner behind them. That being said, it has always been a unified understanding that the creative tool of an actor is himself, his body, his soul, and his spirit. He doesn't have a brush, he doesn't have an instrument, he doesn't have a substance to manipulate. It is himself, the whole human entity. A credible, professionally-minded actor works very hard to train his body, open his soul, and inform his mind, and become aware of his spirit. It was Stanislavski who said, an actor is only as deep as his spirit is. However, his ability to bring this to the stage in a powerful way with the capacity for a larger-than-life expression and penetrating force into the souls and bodies of audience members depends on an ability to integrate his own body, soul, and spirit as one unit. In our postmodern world, the secular point of view of the human entity uh, separates that entity into two stories. The lower story, which is simply material substance, biological matter, and crassly utilitarian. And then the upper story, which is the soul and mind, and which makes all the choices for the body and defines the human entity as a personhood. The body becomes just a collection or of matter with no purpose and can be used for any particular or practical goal that the upper story chooses. The upper story remains superior and in charge. In this demeaning and alienating treatment of the physical biological body, the whole human entity lacks the integrity, power, and expression of unity.
Instead, a duality exists in a static tension of fragmentation. Can anyone say deconstructivism? The purpose of deconstructivism is to take the parts out of the whole and throw, them, throw the whole away. Now, to the point of how this all affects acting techniques, which showed up in spades in Romeo and Juliet, let's turn to the most prized acting technique a performer aspires to, and that is presentness. To be believable, effective, and powerful on the stage, the actor needs to remain present to the moment at all times. So I want to unpack this technique a little, because all other techniques will be diminished or facilitated by the skill of remaining present on the stage. Here's a quote from John Halperin. He was an actor in Peter Brook's famous production, The Conference of the Birds, and wrote a book about it. He's relating to Moishe Feldenkrais, one of uh, actors' premier training sources, whose most famous book, Awareness Through Movement, is a true actor's handbook on presentness. Here, he is referencing the need to understand the whole integrated human being and develop a heightened awareness of all the parts in that integrated unit responding to stimuli. He says, the actor is trained to become so organically related within himself, he thinks completely with his body, integrated to his soul and his mind. He becomes one sensitive, prolonged whole, like a cat. This becomes magnetic on the stage and powerfully penetrating. It's a most coveted acting technique. But this means we must truly be able to hear, see, feel stimuli in real time on the stage and reflexively, organically respond with total human verisimilitude. This requires that we are embodied, totally immersed in our body. In this way, we have a kinesthetic sense of ourself, the sixth sense, where we feel a present tense connection between the body, the soul, and the spirit as to what we do and how we react in any given moment. Then, at any moment, we are fully physically, emotionally, and mentally alive on the stage, present, not dead or asleep. It is this integrated awareness that roots our self in our self. If we have that awareness, presence we can react in accordance with time and change around us rather than just with a kind of brain activity which keeps you actually on the outside of what is going on and unable to respond organically as a whole uh, in real time. Contrarily, we desire to remain highly alert to the flux of communication directed toward us on the stage, whether that is by word or physical action or other stimuli, internal or external. Awareness means we are not being controlled by a disembodied brain, but instead are a whole immersed into our body, connected to our soul and mind, which has a powerful penetrating effect on the audience. Whenever we are outside of our bodies and operating in the mind alone, the reception of stimuli is missed, and our reaction timing is off Thus, a sense of perceived falseness dominates our playing. The audience knows. So the question often, or often arises, but what about the need to think on uh, and control our techniques while we're acting? Remembering our lines, our choreography, keeping our voice open, art articulating clearly, being concerned with our stage positions, etc., etc. Well... I will quote another renowned martial arts master who said, quite simply, quote, techniques will happen in the absence of conscious thought, unquote. This is why the first step of learning a role is to put our text, our choreography, our blocking down into our brain stems so that it is rising to our need automatically 
just like your brain brings up the coordination of riding a bike or driving a car when you need it need it, even though your conscious mind is responding present tense to the traffic outside, the conditions of the road, or maybe even talking with the person in the car. We do this by the process of repetition. That's how we put things down in the archive unit of the brain. Yes, I know it's a very ugly word, repetition, but that's it. And there's no other way around it. Our whole being has to be present during performance to the flux of the stimuli of the moment on stage. The rehearsal techniques, all of those things, must come up automatically, and they will. They will, if we take sufficient time and effort to place it in the brain stem through repetition. Okay, so let's get back to the need for you to be a whole and integrated body, soul, and spirit in order to heighten your self-awareness and remain present on the stage. If we are living in the tension of fragmentation where the soul is actually alienated from the body and the body can't communicate to the soul, has no voice to the soul, because it is in a different story and it is inferior. We can't pull the whole together. And our creative expression will certainly be truncated in, in many ways. Let me give you a perfect example of how this works. The voice. The voice is not a function of the mind. The voice is a function of the body. It is muscular and it is empowered by the body. So when the voice is centered in the mind, the voice loses the subtle inflections and color of emotions because the delicate muscle fibers around the laryngeal area do not have an integrated communication with the soul and the mind. A tension between body and soul produces a voice totally lacking substance, color, texture, and emotional subtlety. Shakespearean text is among the most difficult of all dramatic texts to perform because Shakespeare's characters are huge in their souls and intensely dynamic in their emotional variance. Shakespeare moves his characters at record speeds through their agonies and ecstasies, adding yet another challenge to performing his work. To do it effectively, the performer, at the very least, must be a whole integrated human entity, body, soul, and spirit, capable of remaining present on the stage, responding to all stimuli instantly with an authentic expression by means of sensitive communication between the physical body, the soul, Romeo and Juliet's romance in uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company's production reminded me very much of the postmodern hookup culture, which is the result of this bifurcated human entity. In this culture, sponsored by the worldview of secular materialism, the duality between the body, matter, and the soul, upper story, allows the soul to use the body in a utilitarian way. Therefore, to hook up with a partner on a purely physical basis with no integrated involvement of soul and spirit, but only as the mind sees this is practical to its own desires, this is emblematic of postmodern thought processes. The dignity and holistic human entity which God created has portents to the divine, as does Shakespeare's incomparable love story between Juliet and Romeo, which espouses the divine principles of love. True love is to lay down your life for another. Love is stronger than death. However, the RSC's production completely missed this. Let's stick with our example of the actor's voice, and we can see how postmodern duality connects with missing the essential characteristics of Romeo and Juliet. The two performers both handled the text mechanically in a professional and learned way. This is a function of the brain, but the voice was totally void of 
bodily influence. This resulted in the vocal expression lacking the gut-impacting visceral punch of Shakespeare's words, his verse and his prose. Therefore, the emotions which they tried to design for portrayal were of the mind and not of the body. Sexual attraction without the whole integration of the soul and spirit becomes simply lust, the body being used in a utilitarian way for pleasure. Then the physical love between Romeo and Juliet is demeaned, it's reduced it to something as common as the activity of a bitch in heat and the male that pants after her. Nothing special here. No divine touch of a desire to be one body, soul, and spirit with another, but instead just a bodily function gone wrong. The transcendent nature of Romeo and Juliet's love is gone. The results are that the alienating tensions between body, soul, and spirit, which deconstructs the wholeness of the human being, leaves it incapable of meeting the elevated emotional demands of a playwright like Shakespeare. Emotions stimulated by the mind without the body are vacant, hollow, and superficial. Emotions stimulated by the holistic mind, soul, and body are powerful. They can be life-changing, penetrating deep into the audience's whole being. The truth of this was painfully apparent in Romeo and Juliet as Romeo attempts to weep uncontrollably when he learns of his forced separation from Juliet due to his exile. The forced shoulder-shaking and head-bobbing was completely disconnected to the vocal semblance of crying. Likewise, we experienced it in Juliet's attempt at dying at the end of the tomb scene. Trying as hard as she could, the body she was weeping in was fully partitioned away from her soul and her mind. In both cases, the forced mind emotions was void of all organic truth. We just didn't care, and were distracted by trying to tap down our own embarrassment watching uh, their fruitless efforts to appear to be torn apart in their sorrow. The vocalizing of Shakespeare's passionate, visceral verse and prose was rhetorical, cold, mechanical, and false, because the actors were centered in their soul and their mind, without the animating, grounding grace of the human body. I want to just give you a postscript to this uh, podcast. I wanted to be clear uh, in my intent in this podcast. I'm not saying that these actors lack talent or capable artistic skills. What I'm saying is that their artistic techniques and perspectives have been hijacked by inculcated attitudes coming from the principles which underpin postmodernism and secular materialism. And they are ubiquitous in contemporary worldviews. My point is to make the actor aware of how these thought systems are making their way inside our artistic techniques and perspectives. Thanks for listening. Till next time we meet here on the podcast channel, Whispers in the Wings. You've been listening to Kathleen Ann Thompson, director of Bellhurst Productions. Visit us at www.bellhurst.com.